Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry lab video covers the dehydration of 2-methyl cyclohexanol experiment. This is part one, the pre-lab lecture. The procedure for today's experiment is going to involve reading the procedure in the lab manual, viewing this narrated PowerPoint presentation, watching videos on parts two and three of the experiment, complete the associated lab notebook and post-lab file template on Google Docs and then submit it to Canvas, complete the lab homework for the experiment on saplinglearning.com, and then finally, take the quiz for this experiment on sapling learning. Today's experiment is going to involve the dehydration of 2-methylcyclohexanol, and the steps in today's experiment are reversible. The reaction starts with 2-methylcyclohexanol, which is shown here. Naming of alcohols is covered in a lecture video, but these numbers are provided to give you a sense of how the molecule is named. The OH group is on the 1 position and the methyl group is in the 2 position, hence the name 2-methylcyclohexanol. OH groups are poor leaving groups because hydroxide is a strong base. This molecule won't undergo a substitution or elimination reaction on its own, but if we put in an acid like phosphoric acid, the acid can protonate the OH group and generate a protonated version of it that has a good leaving group because it's a weak base. The leaving group leaves and that generates a secondary carbocation which is shown here. The secondary carbocation has two distinct beta positions. If we deprotonate the beta position here, that'll give the following alkene product with a double bond between the one and two carbons. The name of this molecule is 1-methylcyclohexene and you can see the numbering here on the ring to see how the molecule is named. The other beta positions are shown here. If those were deprotonated by the weak base, the following compound would get produced where there's a double bond between the one and the two carbons listed in this structure. And the name of that molecule is 3-methylcyclohexene. The details of alkene naming will be covered later in a lecture video. This carbocation is a secondary carbocation and Secondary carbocations have somewhat marginal stability. Tertiary carbocations are more stable. One of the things that this molecule can do is it can rearrange through a process called a 1-2 hydride shift to become a more stable carbocation. The way that works is that a neighboring hydrogen moves with a pair of electrons in this hydride shift reaction and that looks like this. The neighboring hydrogen takes a pair of bonding electrons and moves over one. This will effectively change the positions of the hydrogen and the carbocation and give this rearranged species, which is now a tertiary carbocation. The carbocation is now in a more substituted spot and that's more stable. This reaction is not reversible because it goes from a less stable to a much more stable carbocation. Once this tertiary carbocation forms, there are some new beta positions that are available for deprotonation that'll lead to different alkene products. If a beta proton is deprotonated from one of these locations, the product is actually the same alkene as is up above, 1-methylcyclohexene. Both carbocations produce one of the same alkenes. There's a different beta position that's now available though. Now the methyl group is a beta position to this new carbocation, and if a base deprotonates that species, you get to a new molecule that has a name of methylene cyclohexene. These are the alkene products that could get produced in the experiment today. 1-methylcyclohexene is a tri-substituted alkene, whereas 3-methylcyclohexene and methylene cyclohexane are both disubstituted alkenes. The tri-substituted alkene is more stable, so it's going to be the major product, while the disubstituted alkenes are going to be minor products based on substitution, and this is Zaitsev's rule. This slide I'll talk about some changes in energy and equilibrium. Alcohols and alkenes interconvert in the presence of acid, and an equilibrium is established shown here. Near room temperature, though, the equilibrium doesn't strongly favor the alkene products. So to get a good yield of this, we're going to have to do something to help promote the formation of products. We're going to use a simple distillation to remove the lower boiling alkene products as they form. This is going to drive the reaction towards products by Le Chatelier's principle. This works because the alkenes, the products, are lower boiling than the starting materials. The starting alcohol has a fairly high boiling point, 165 to 167, because it has strong intermolecular forces due to the hydrogen bonding capabilities associated with this OH group. The product alkenes are lower boiling, they can't form hydrogen bonds, they don't even have dipole-dipole interactions, so they're less polar, their intermolecular forces are weaker, and they boil lower. 102 to 103 for methylene cyclohexane, 103 to 104 for 3-methylcyclohexene, and 110 to 111 for 1-methylcyclohexene. And of course water boils at 100. So the products all boil lower than the starting material. If we boil the reaction mixture, we'll get distillate that'll be primarily the products we're looking for. So we distill those off as they form, we collect those in a distillation apparatus, and that'll drive the reaction towards products. The product mixture will then be analyzed by GC. 
GC standards of the following molecules will be run for you and posted above each gas chromatograph. No, we don't have a standard for 3-methylcyclohexene. This one is not commercially available and we just couldn't get a hold of it. So what you'll want to do is just use the boiling point of that species relative to the other standards to infer its location. Dilute your sample for GC analysis by adding one drop of the product mixture to one milliliter of acetone and then inject one to two microliters of that solution. We need to dilute the sample to analyze it by GC because it's just too concentrated to analyze in its pure form. All the peaks except acetone need to be on scale and not have flat tops. If they're off scale, the sample is too concentrated and you'll need to dilute the sample. If the peaks are too small, you'll need to concentrate the sample in order to get a chromatogram with well-sized peaks. For all peaks except the solvent acetone, you're going to want to get statistics information, which has the retention time. You'll want to get integration, which tells you the area of the peak. And then you'll also want to text annotate each peak to list its identity. You want to distinguish also between the cis and trans alcohol peaks because they have different boiling points and they're well separated on our GC, so we'll see them as two separate peaks. The starting material is actually a mixture of two alcohols, the cis and the trans, and we'll see that in the product mixture if there's any leftover alcohols. Yield calculations are described on this slide. Use the balanced equation below showing the formation of 1-methylcyclohexene in your yield calculations. Now there's many other alkene products that are possible, but this is the balanced equation for the formation of this product. Since it's the major product in this reaction, this is the one we're going to focus on and this is the one we're going to do yield calculations for. You could do yield calculations for any of the other minor alkene products, but we're going to focus on the major one. You should note that phosphoric acid is a catalyst in this experiment and it doesn't get consumed and therefore it doesn't figure into the yield calculations. So although you need phosphoric acid to get the reaction to go at a reasonable rate, it doesn't impact the yield. Calculate the moles of 2-methylcyclohexanol used in this reaction. This is actually the only reagent in the reaction and therefore it's the limiting reagent. Calculate the theoretical yield as you did in last week's experiment. Your reaction mixture is going to contain multiple compounds and you need to use the GC chromatogram to calculate the mass of 1-methylcyclohexene that you produced in the experiment. The mass of the material that you distilled is not pure 1-methylcyclohexene. It's a mixture of 1-methylcyclohexene and the other minor alkene products. In order to calculate the actual yield of this alkene from the mixture that was produced, you're going to use the following equation. The mass of 1-methylcyclohexene that was produced is going to equal the area of the 1-methylcyclohexene peak in the chromatogram divided by the sum of the areas of all the peaks in the chromatogram except acetone and multiply that times the mass of the crude product mixture. That'll give you the mass of 1-methylcyclohexene and that would be your actual yield that you'll use in the yield calculations. Finally, we're going to do some color tests to check for the presence of double bond. There's a test for presence of double bonds that involves bromine solution. Here's the reaction. An alkene which is colorless can react with orange bromine to produce a colorless product. We're going to do three experiments involving this color change reaction. The first is going to be a positive control experiment. The purpose of this test is just to see what a positive test looks like and make sure that we can identify it when we see it. It's going to involve getting a small test tube that has 2% bromine solution, which is orange, and putting in the cyclohexene control. This is a species that we expect will react because it has a double bond, so this will allow us to see what a positive test looks like. Then we'll also do a negative control experiment. This is an experiment that we expect to give a negative result. It's important to know what a negative result looks like. Again, we'll have this 2% bromine solution in a small test tube, and this time we'll add cyclohexane. And I've underlined here the vowel because it's important, A versus E, to distinguish these two species. They're very different. Cyclohexane has no alkene functional group and it'll give a negative test, while the cyclohexene has a double bond functional group, it'll give a positive test. Finally, we'll do our experimental sample, our distilled compound that we expect contains double bonds. We'll take another test tube that has 2% bromine in it, we'll add the reaction mixture, and we'll see what we get. Do we get a positive test that confirms the presence of alkene, or do we get a negative test that says the reaction didn't actually work? Next, we're going to do a test for the presence of CC double bonds that involves adding potassium permanganate solution. The reaction looks like this. A colorless alkene will react with purple permanganate to give a colorless diol product and red-brown manganese dioxide. This is not quite as fast as the bromine reaction, so you're going to need to shake well and be patient with this one. We're going to do again a positive control where we take a permanganate solution and we add a species that we know will give a positive result, cyclohexene, and we'll observe what happens, write it down in your notebook, and take note of it. 
Then we'll do a negative control, which is the same experiment, but using a substrate that we know doesn't have an alkene, so this will give us a negative test, and we'll see what a negative test looks like with this experiment. Then we'll do the experimental sample, which we expect contains a carbon-carbon double bond, and we'll see what result we get. If it's positive, the molecule contains a CC double bond. If it's negative, then it doesn't. There's some safety concerns for today's experiment. The first is we're using concentrated phosphoric acid, which is extremely corrosive. You need to wear gloves when you're using that reagent. You'll also want to avoid skin contact with the starting alcohol, 2-methylcyclohexanol, as well as the alkene products, 1-methylcyclohexene and 3-methylcyclohexene. You'll need to wear gloves when you're handling those products as well. 2% bromine solution is corrosive, it's a strong oxidizing agent, and it's also volatile, so you'll want to wear gloves and avoid the vapor from that test solution. The 1% potassium permanganate solution that we're using in today's experiment is a strong oxidizing agent, and you'll want to wear gloves when you're handling that. And then finally, we're doing a distillation today, and you're going to want to wait until your distillation apparatus is cooled before you disassemble the parts that get hot. This is to prevent vapor from escaping the hot apparatus and into the lab. If you allow it to cool, the vapor condenses, and it's not as big of an inhalation risk. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series, or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.